Hello, I'm Lorenzo and you're watching KSP to Mars, episode 25. Last episode I misspoke, that was actually 24, but today we have 25 here. What you're looking at is the Mars lander, um, not the Mars lander, the moon lander. The show is titled KSP to Mars, but so far we are mostly going to the moon and those kind of things. The lander is nuclear powered, it resembles the failed landers of the previous episode, but this one is better because it is larger. We have three of the semi-large small fuel tanks and two of them are discardable, they are also the legs and the center one that will serve as the Gatta's home stage. The capsule itself will be the re-entry vehicle and the occupant will retrieve the science data and surface samples and store them in the capsule. That's the plan. This lander by itself has 9.5 kilometers of delta V, and if we uh, put our stock launcher, well, I call it the stock launcher, it's just the staple launcher that I've been using for the past few episodes under that, then that should give it somewhere in the vicinity of 20 21 kilometers per second, hopefully, enough for a successful mm, lunar sample return mission. That will all happen in just a little bit. For now though, we're going to switch out the nuclear engine for a, well, let's try this engine, the 909 engine. No, we need a bigger one. Just anything that gives us a thrust to weight ratio of, well, higher than one really, because what we're doing now is taking this lander for a spin. Uh, this is the gimbalable one. We're going to take this lander for a spin around the launch pad and cash in some easy science points that have been laying uncached for a few episodes, well all of them. Uh, the KSC itself is a proper biome as is the runway and of course the launch pad. Now the launch pad has been scienced out, I think at any rate, we're going to, ch we're going to check that just to be sure, but we're going to put this... Ooh, no. This... Oh, please do survive. Right, so that did not go so well. This lander doesn't isn't too happy spawning on the launch pad. Let's see where we are at now. At KSC, great. Well, keep that report then. Transmit that. Is the antenna still attached? Yes, the antenna is still attached. But the onboard power supply, of course, is not. Now, well, let's go EVA then. Then we have... <laughs> We have the KSC, not quite as in the way we planned that. Keep the data, and of course we're going to take a soil sample from this very swampy runway. Lure, take a surface sample, nine science points, great, and then we can go ahead and recover the vessel. <laughs> um, we're going to have to do this again anyway to do to get the science from the uh, from the containers. But for that we might need to modify our lander to, well, actually stand on the launch pad before taking off and then landing. Hey, we have 24 signs now, we might just, if the runway and the stuff, if the, if the material in the goo containers give some good science, we might actually be able to unlock a 90 point node with that. I don't remember how much they give. But we're going to try that at any rate, so let me try and solve this problem by adding launch clamps. I think that should solve this problem. You can notice how high up I am scrolling because, well, most of the time these rockets are super big when I launch them. There we go. We're not counting on any casualties today, or at least the the moon guy might die, but we're not counting on a casualty at home. Then again, the Apollo 1 crew did tragically die in a fire in a command module test after that day decided not to use uh, pure oxygen atmosphere in their spacecraft anymore, but instead opt for, well this starts high up, instead opt for uh, a low pressure oxygen, no no, uh, just a uh, regular air atmosphere, the low pressure oxygen is in the space suits, they use 200 millibars of pure oxygen as opposed to um, full pressure air, right. We have this from the launch pad, and we are, of course, going to try and la land this at the KSC. Important for that is to not immediately crash. This is harder to land than I was expecting, probably because the reaction wheels are not as powerful and because the thrust to weight is actually fairly low on this. It's a top heavy lander. When we are landing it on the moon, I am counting on the fact... Oh... I'm counting on the fact that the legs are not going to sink into the terrain, but, well, this does count as a landing in my book. 
observe the mystery goo at the KSC, great, we can recover that for scrutiny, observe the materials bay that's seven and a half science, wonderful and we have the temperature data, lock the temperature lock the temperature, oh uh, yeah, keep that ooh, look at that, one of the cranes is falling over, I didn't even know that could happen right, well, that was that little excursion, go ahead and recover this vessel the next one will be a little bit harder, it will be the sampling the runway now of course, if this doesn't work out, we can always slap together something and launch it from the runway which is exactly what I'm going to do if it fails but I am going to try and set down the lander on the runway because where is the challenge in just plopping some science parts on the runway right so let's have a look what is our oh, it's already called the Luna Lander Mark II a little bit of a misnomer for this mission but hey science is science and we have to figure out what our runway is actually made of is it cheese is it mud is it the brains of deceased kerbals or perhaps something else entirely? Could it be asphalt? That sounds way too sensible. That's why we send a kerbal to find out. Uh, let's go for that. And if you're wondering why I'm doing this instead of well, an actual mission, there's a very easy answer to that. It's because my computer is busy rendering, so I've a little lander like this it can handle while rendering whereas a 300 part orbital launcher it cannot ha handle so very well so what I'm just considering is that I might be able to use the parachute to aid in this landing so let's slow down 30 meters per second return to a vertical orientation we have to thrust a little bit in the opposite direction but I am going to touch down straight on that launch pad you will see you will see full thrust full thrust cut thrust deploy parachute full thrust and cut thrust oh yeah great landing the legs are all gone but we are in the middle of the launch pad just as I promised wonderful so, a crew report. Oh, I have to be quick because this is listing. Transmit the crew report. Take a goo sample. Keep the goo sample. Take a materials bay sample. And keep that. And let's have a look at this goo canister also. Keep that as well. And now, for the challenging bit, we can leave this behind and recover that later. And Vin Kerben, here, there is a jump waiting for you because, of course, we want the ground and EVA sample as well, oof, oof, oof painful that, painful that, EVA report keep it, and of course the surface sample, keep that as well and, well, why not put a flag this can be a start line flag for all the coming drag races on this strip let's have a look at that ready go and recover him it's called a vessel it's a, it's a person it's not a vessel Are you kidding me crazy 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 kids so we have up to 50 signs now and we can go to the tracking station and recover that other vessel to give us more science. Not going to be 40 points, so no free nodes, but a definite few points in, well, just a few minutes really. So that was a good tip, 11.2 extra. We are at 61 science now. We only need 30, well, technically 29, to unlock a fresh node. Of course, our probe to Uranus is still very much on the way, and in about 100 days, we'll have three launch windows coming up to EVE, to MOHO, and to JUUL, or rather their uh, real solar system representation. So that's Mercury, Venus, and Jupiter. It'll be exciting to launch probes there, but as with the probe to Uranus, that will not give us any results within a few years. Possibly Mercury might be a bit faster, but it's not going to be an instant affair. Not unless we hit the time warp at any rate. So let's have a look at the 
research station here what I'm wanting most is these two more propulsion technologies and for that I'm guessing we need to well mm, this one is going to have a mystery addition somewhere I'm going to guess it's this one the large control we need 300 science for that and what we get is the cupola module which is nice for space stations but rather useless a large lander can which is something we won't use and an RCS fuel tank which we've never used before it's far very dear for to spend 300 points on this and we're not going to use it so I'm afraid this propulsion stuff is going to have to wait otherwise here we have docking ports this is pretty amazing because that means we can do orbital construction and in the last episode I've discovered that rendezvousing around the larger earth is not any more difficult than to do it around the smaller one so I'm confident we can do rendezvous and we can assemble nice big spacecraft to take us everywhere so this is high on the list 160 points what we have here is airplane stuff I don't like that what we have here is well more SAS some uh, some probe cores this probe core is nice to have because it allows you to build up and down but it's definitely low on the list then we have precision engineering if we're going to have the probe core we really need this as well so we can make tiny tiny probes then again large nuclear powered probes do the job as well so would be nice but not high on the list this stuff electricity tech and radiators high on the list because while well, the batteries the, I, I believe that the better solar panels they are uh, fairly self-explanatory but I want the radiators because when we start doing the interstellar stuff with the nuclear reactors and so on we need that radiating uh, radiating power this of course another sensor always good to have and here we have wheels which I don't care for so basically it's a contest between another sensor no it's a contest between the small probe stuff and the docking adapters and the docking adapters are going to win with that so we need 100, 100 points and then we have that that allows a lot more a lot more construction options and Apollo like missions and all that good stuff so that's for the introduction let's move on to launching a lunar mission and of course before launch we have astronaut selection today we have Lubald Kerman our most courageous one he is going to make the trip to the moon and hopefully return safe and sound a somewhat familiar view, the Kerbal Engineer overview, we have 20.1 kilometers per second of delta V in this rocket. This is not substantially more than our rescue craft had, yet that was unable to return safely. Uh, however, we are not going to bother with inclination changes. We are just going to land wherever we uh, happen to end up on the moon and return immediately from there. Hopefully that is going to make all the difference uh, in Delta V that will allow us to get back. If it does not, then we have another casualty to jog up to the list. But it will happen in such a way, hopefully, that he can transmit the findings home before he dies little bit grim maybe but that's the state of our space program and Lubald is fully aware of it so let's see where the moon is if that is in any or well more like let's see how Kerbin is rotated today what direction we have to launch and um, that is a somewhat northerly direction let's uh, set the moon as a target just in case and prepare for a lift off so as always unless something crazy happens I'm going to fast forward through this launch because boy does it take Ooh, we have structure failure yet already yes this is definitely a problem something has happened I think I waited too long in launching the missile so the challenge now becomes to save Lubalt I'm going to try and keep going up until this becomes uncontrollable and then he has to survive the fuselage, fuselage of solid boosters that will happen now please Lubald there he survived that that's great now we can cut the engines and do all the stages so that he might survive uh, he might survive in his nuclear go on go on go on go on give us the parachute stage faster whoa no, Lubal died in this inferno of rockets. Too bad, too bad. Um, 
I could revert, but then Lubald's death would have been in vain <laughs> if it wasn't already. Sorry, Lubald. <laughs> Big plans, no success. I don't know why this happens. Sometimes when I put this rocket on the pad, uh, it instantly fails. Sometimes it fails on launching, but most of the time it goes fine. So there's no reason to change anything. Anvin, next one up. Let's see how he gets on then. I'm going to change the rule as long as we get off the pad without catastrophic failure. I'm going to fast forward to a, well, a more interesting point, probably immediately to the lunar encounter. This stuff in orbit, mucking about and doing the trajectories. You've seen that before. And I had a whole introductory thing where we explored the KSC. So this in this episode is running longer than anticipated already before we're even off the pad. So let's have a quick peek at the flight log. No damages there. We have Anvin here, already forgot that other episode. And we have liftoff without catastrophic vessel disintegration. Uh, that's always a good start to any mission. So, I will see you around the moon if all goes well. Here we are, almost through our translunar injection burn. Let's switch to the map view and see how we can make our nicest approach. I'm going to delete the maneuver node now and just inch forward until we get that intercept. Quick peek at the engineer shows that we have about 6 kilometers per second of delta V left after this encounter will be set up. The big question of course is will that be enough for a nice landing and a subsequent return to Kerbin. Previous episodes, some trial and error there with the rescue vehicle shows us that uh, we need about two and a half meters per second, kilometers per second, excuse me, for a successful escape from the moon. And we are now heading there with six kilometers per second in our tanks. I am hopeful that we will be able to land uh, with three of that. So let me accelerate time forward and join you when we are there. Here we are at the moon and um, look at that, the encounter is pretty close at 600 kilometers, 700 kilometers and I made a maneuver node to put us in a close orbit over the moon. That's 800 meters per second of delta V and then we were, if I'm estimating, we'll be at an orbital velocity of about 12 to 1500 meters per second. Totaling that gives us 2300 with 700 allowing for losses will net us a budget of 3000 meters per second to get back once we're down. That looks good. That looks good. That makes me happy. Something else that makes me happy is the fact that our science experiments apparently have not been done in space high over the moon yet. So I'm putting one of the goo canisters on keep data. The materials bay is also not done yet, but I'm keeping that on reset. I know I can do that afterwards, but I, there's no conceivable way I'm going to not want to overwrite that. Whereas I have one goo canister free here, so I might as well keep this. Plan is to do this in low space over the moon, see if that makes a difference. And I have two, one that's one will be higher than the other, and the lowest one I will ditch in favor for a surface sample, which will be lower still. What I want to remember is that this space area over the moon has not been scienced out yet, and I can send a quick mission with some canisters, some science experiments, to uh, fix that, to do the science there. So. Let's have a look at the temperature, cannot be done here, doesn't matter. So just wanted to share that with you and I'll be back once this orbital burn is completed and we're coming in for a landing. So strap in tight and see you then. And here we are coming near to the moon. We have our periapsis of about 20 kilometers. And looking at these science experiments definitely makes me a happy man. The goo from high in space was about 30 to return. The go here near space will also be 30. I'm going to reset this because I'm expecting the one from the surface to be even more. And the materials bay from here is 75. That means that whether this mission is successful or not, there is 130, 100, wait, 100 and that's 60 and 75, 135 science to be gained by just a flyby mission to the moon with two materials bay, two material bays and two goo canisters, wait, even more, yeah, uh, hundreds, hundreds of sciences are to be gained, that's the bottom line. So 
that is probably going to be the next mission regardless of what happens today and of course hopefully we will be able to return lots of science from the surface and so far everything is looking good we have uh, 5200 meters per second of delta V left we have about 1700 to scrub from here that's three and a half thousand remaining uh, well if we leave 500 allowance for some wastage some inefficiencies then we have three kilometers per second to get home again that's probably going to be enough I think I hope it well it has to be but otherwise well otherwise I don't know what to do it at least it should be enough to get off the moon so if all goes wrong and we end up in a lunar orbit then we can send a second mission with the science payload to get that science and to get Anvin. Anyway, then we are uh, in good shape because we've so far not yet returned anyone from the surface alive, not even a, a robotic probe. But if we can get him back to lunar orbit, we uh, can conceivably send a rescue mission because from there we are uh, demonstrably capable of getting back to Earth. All right. Let's start considering firing the engine. Oh, the time acceleration is right quick. Considering firing the engine to slow down. Let's have a look at the surface. We are 30 kilometers over the terrain and still dropping. So I think it's about time. I'm going to start firing the engine. Here we go. And because we're in a vacuum, we, of course, have don't have to contend with any aerodynamic concerns. I'm going to go ahead and deploy the landing legs just in case we suddenly encounter some terrain or I'll forget it. Well, 1700 meters per second is a fair amount of speed to scrub off. That will take a while. So I will see you upon touchdown or, well, uh, uh, just before that because, of course, that is a monumental occasion and I wouldn't want you to miss that. So see you in a bit. Yeah, so those Delta V losses I was talking about, they're coming into play now. Uh, we're still moving at 800 meters per second, which is way fast, and our vertical speed, if you look here in the flight engineer, is 90 meters per second. So I'm pointing up, hoping to slow that down, because our altitude is just 4 kilometers. That means we're going to slam into the surface right quick if we don't do something about that. So that is definitely wasting energy. We're standing on our plume while uh, that buys us the time to slow down. Um, I'm going to manage it. It was at 140. Um, it is of course okay to go down because that's what we want to do, but I don't want to cut it too close. If, uh, well, if we're going down at 100 meters per second at a few kilometers altitude, that gives us not more than just a few seconds of margin, and that's not something I want. We are now at 3 kilometers. I'm not seeing any high ridges on the horizon, so of course falling down at a few tens of meters per second is perfectly okay but I was wondering if our craft had the thrust to weight ratio to cope with that and fortunately it did that does mean that our um, ascent and safe return to Kerbin is no longer assured because we are burning fuel to not crash instead of to get home this ground is looking scarily close it is still two kilometers but oof. I'm um, just not comfortable with skimming it that close. We are f slowing down now. If we were in air at sea level, we would just be going under Mach 1 now, which is quite a feat for being at 1,800 meters of altitude. Um, again, if we look at the vessel display, we have 3,300 meters per second left. Uh, orbital speed is about 17, 1,800 meters per second, so we definitely have enough for orbit, which would make any rescue uh, relatively easy. So overall, still happy with the mission. Uh, we're at just coming up on a kilometer of altitude now. Ooh, and our vertical speed has increased to 50 meters per second again while I was talking. That is a problem. Thrusting upwards, thrusting upwards, 700 meters of altitude. Oh dear, 15 meters of vertical speed. Ah, according to the numbers, that was not a close call. According to the screen, though, that was a very close call because I was incredibly scared that we were going to slam into the ground. I am not a robot. My mechanical, my biological heart... Uh, has trouble coping with these high strain environments. Anyway, here we are coming up on the surface. We're moving at nothing, at just under. Oh, uh, I'm having trouble speaking numbers. We're moving slowly and everything is fine. That's what I'm trying to communicate to you. So, 
if you would just believe that. 14 meters per second now, um, and we are at 250 meters of altitude. So nice and low, and of course we want to combine that with nice and slow with a touchdown speed of about 5 meters per second, or less if at all possible. Trying to have that rocket upright which of course is important the fairings of the nuclear engine are still attached because I was afraid if I jettisoned them that the they would explode against those side tanks I'm not sure if they add weight they sure as hell make the rocket ugly just 30 meters up now descending at about 2 meters per second so a touchdown should be imminent and indeed there is our shadow Currently moving at 1.5 meters per second, which should be a very, very doable speed. Look at that, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1.2, and touch down. Uh, shut off the engine and let the stability system do its thing. So there we are, 2,854 meters per second remaining. More than the failed rescue vessel, less than I was expecting. So we did burn more in compensating for our horrible trajectory. But that's nothing to be helped. Can't do anything about that. Nothing to do but the science, of course. So let's start with this goo container. Here we have 40 points. Less than I was expecting, but this is biome specific, so can be repeated a lot of times. The moon's midlands. Keep the data. Going for the science bay, the materials. 100 points. That's wonderful. Keep the data. A crew report, just to be sure. Hey, from the Midlands, great, so that we can transmit that home, 20 points, immediate gain, that's always good. And now it's time for Anvin to go outside. I think we had the EVA report of flying over the Midlands, yes we did, yes we did. So I'm going to let go and jet back gently down to the surface, where he will do the most important thing and plant a flag of course. And we shall call this the Midland Spectacle. And I will just type that. Midland Spectacle. Wonderful. Oh, I shouldn't forget the temperature reading. It's probably not going to let me do that on the moon, but hey. Surface sample for 120 points if returned. That's, of course, wonderful. Let's do that and a EVA report from the Midlands also get and we can radio that back so keep the data and then we have to jet back back up into the pod and then we have one more excursion to do oh. and that's of course to get the samples back into the command pod oh that's actually a lot easier to do in space because then we are uh, in zero G so I'm going to do that in space get on board Review that data, transmit that home, that's 30 points from here, and we're going to keep the rocks. So we're still hopeful that we can return safe and sound for that full 120 gain. So we are nicely equatorial, and that means to get home to Kerbin, it doesn't really matter, we should... Uh, is this us? This is us, so we're not equatorial at all. Oh well. Um, that means that we, let's see how is our orbit, but we should aim for a 270 degree exit vector, we get an orbit around the moon in this plane and then eject from there, yeah, so oh, it doesn't really matter, either 270, no, slightly under, so going to aim for, well, one of the two, 270 or 90, uh, something like that yeah it doesn't matter which way you're orbiting the moon as, as long as you have your orbit you can eject uh, as long as you eject from the moon retrograde relative to the moon's orbital direction around the earth that's what I'm trying to say it didn't say that in the most eloquent fashion important now is of course to take off and then as soon as possible to ditch these uh, side tanks and I'm going to do just that so Let's try that now. No sense postponing our takeoff. Uh, take a look at that wonderful flat terrain. Samples all aboard and let's go. Go, 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 go. Ditch the legs. Goodbye. 
and finally ditch those fairings also goodbye so to turn over now and burn hard for the horizon 2700 meters per second remaining that should do it I hope it will do it I hope I hope I hope it can do it I hope it can do it oh how I hope it can do it <laughs> something tells me it can't do it we needed 3000 meters per second to get up to the moon's height from low earth orbit then we needed 700 more to to stay here that means we can probably get back f mm, for about 700 from the moon's orbit we should we might be able to make it anyway this burn will take a while mm. yeah this burn will take a while we need to escape purely retrograde in that direction it's going to be hard on this trajectory we need to aim it more towards the 90 degree mark and it's also going to be hella hard oh wait no this was going fine it's also going to be hard to escape when i'm crashing into the surface because i'm not paying attention to where i'm going and looking at the map and yammering that is a problem Anyway, I'm going to establish this orbit and try and set up an escape node, so see you in a bit after I do that. And here we are, safely in lunar orbit. It's not a high orbit, it's not a high orbit, it's 40 kilometers by 80 kilometers, but it's an orbit and it should serve as fine. And now we are poised to attempt a return to Kerbin. Now remember, it's important that our ejection angle is parallel with uh, the retrograde direction of the moon's orbit, so something like this. So, and now we want to expand that so that uh, our periapsis coincides with, uh, oh look at that, so that our periapsis around Kerbin is as low as possible. So here it's 20 and now we're just going to boost further. I'm going to try and find a maneuver node that will uh, put us on as low an uh, well as as low as a Kerbin intercept as possible. I have a thousand and twenty five meters per second, and I'm just going to drag that around this node here until <gasps> yes, here we have something that intersects Kerbin's ground, and that is of course overkill. So we're not going to do that. We're going to back up off on that 600 kilometers for the cheap cheap price of 897 meters per second 300 kilometers so this means that we definitely can do it and that's wonderful news of course the question now is do we have to end up in such a highly elliptical orbit to do so and see if we reduce it further we go farther out but maybe we can move the node a bit here we end up with the apoapsis somewhat around but we are again very far out because we have changed along the orbit well you know I'm just going to decide I don't care about the ellipticity eccentricity the ellipticalness and I just want this trajectory to intersect the planet just barely just barely let's see what's our what's our periapsis now does it do we have a periapsis there we have a periapsis 300 kilometers 15 kilometers let's work with this and take it from there it's a minute burn it's it's almost all we have it's 900 meters per second out of a thousand and twenty five and of course then comes the while well, the question of utmost importance whether the capsule is going to survive re-entry from the moon I hope it will I hope it will um, let's lock in the distance the, the, the direction and time warp to that burn I'm going to execute that and put us on a nice re-entry trajectory and I will see you when that um, starts becoming exciting Say goodbye to the moon, this is the last you will see it in this episode. It was lovely and we carry all its science and maybe its moon babies. So, goodbye.
And here we are approaching Earth once more. We're currently still at 25,000 kilometers. And if you've just played the stock game, uh, reference that in your mind. This size of the planet is usually corresponding with a few hundreds of kilometers in altitude, not several thousand. In fact, we are, uh, if I remember how far is the moon, we are one and a half times the uh, distance that the moon orbits in the regular game. So that's scale difference is still astounding sometimes. We are trying to re-enter with a periapsis of 66 kilometers. All the experiment data has been put inside the capsule by trusty Anvin. And of course the rocket is also on a re-entering trajectory. So all that needs to be done now is to separate the capsule from the rocket and see how re-entry treats us hopefully well. So the plan is to separate. I'm going to do that now, so there we go. This will probably not interfere with our re-entry. Um, now we are going to time warp to that re-entry point and we're not going to deploy the chute until well, either we are through the re-entry heating or the g-forces start to uncontrollably mount. If that is the case then Anvin has to take a page out of Bob's book and pull the parachute handle before he gets crushed to death because much as we like him we still are in this for the science and this is going to be a barbecue re-entry at 10.6 kilometers per second hopefully the pod will be aerodynamically stable in its heat shield first orientation uh, however if not we have the reaction wheels to assist us we're now at 92 kilometers at uh, watching a stunning sunset or rise depending on your frame of reference are we traveling this way or that way uh, we are weighing 1.2 tons that's some moon rocks and we are already getting the heating effects at 81 kilometers one thing that we could do if things start looking horrible and unsurvivable is to, uh, well, transmit the data home. We are currently decelerating very quickly at 4 Gs already, at 72 kilometers. We put our periapsis at a 66 kilometers. And let's have a look how the heat shield is doing. That's not ablating as of yet. The G's are rising, we are slamming into the atmosphere. This pod is really frictiony or large. Um, maybe the config is making it larger than it should be. I don't know, it is piling on the G's. And the shield is coping very, very well. We've already scrubbed two kilometers per second of speed and we are getting in the red area now. So hopefully Anvin is going to cope. We're at 11, 12 G's now. This is getting dangerous. I'm having, I have my hand on the reaching crew G limit. Deploy that chute. And now it's just fingers crossed that Envin might survive. The Gs are still rising. We're at just six kilometers per second now. Uh, Envin died. No, fortunately he did pull the handle. So we might still get a lot of science back. Apparently I've been doing the re-entries all wrong with this capsule because it's so draggy, much much more draggy than all the other rocket parts basically and uh, well to be honest I don't really care about the realism of that because well general rocket parts they well they wouldn't stand up to re-entry anyway just the, the aerodynamic forces not so much the heat but just the forces would crumple them straight off so using them to absorb a lot of the re-entry heat isn't realistic in the first place I'm just going to have to get used to letting these pods enter at a higher altitude with a higher periapsis 66 kilometers is apparently just um, too hot a entry for people so we're going to have to aim higher at 70 75 something like 80 kilometers and uh, well a good thing is that the heat shields are a lot better than previously thought well in the stock aerodynamics or when everything was being horrible the heat shields never made it sometimes even burned through now in this case they are completely fine as I said, I'm not sure what bits of that um, what bits of that are realistic and which aren't. But hey, it adds a challenge to figure it out. And even if what I'm figuring out is not exactly analogous to the real world, there is still some value in the process of figuring it out. Bottom line: unfortunately, Anvin died. Fortunately, we are going to get a lot of science. There's nothing I can see that 
going wrong. There's nothing I can see going wrong now. The electricity will run out, the reaction wheels will stop, and then the pod will just safely dangle underneath the parachute. I'm going to cut the video here and rejoin you when we are landed, because we are landing on the dark side and there's nothing interesting to see. Unless me, in a bit, you will see me in a bit. Yes. And as promised, here we are coming in for a sea landing. The science team is eager to open the pod and get the results and the ground crews are well shaking their heads and are unhappy with the fact that their buddy Anvin died and more importantly that they have to clean the capsule. All we care about is recovering this vessel. Let's do so now. I was wondering whether I should send manned one-way missions or not. I decided against it because the Kerbals didn't have a chance of getting back. At least with these missions they have a fighting shot of getting back. They have a chance not to die. That's what matters in our space program. Just wanted to put that out there. Anyway, the results are in and we got 437 science. Well, in total we, we gained 324 science this mission, which is wonderful. Great, great, great. Well done, Anvin. Your, your sacrifice shall not be forgotten. What do we have now? Well, we could get a lot. We can get a lot. We can get this, the useless bit that will aid us on our quest to engines. We can get the docking adapters that will allow us to do Apollo-style moon missions. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards those because then we can do more efficient landings and, uh, well, we just have to dock in lunar orbit and then go home that way. Then we can leave, for instance, the nuclear engine in orbit and descend on a small engine or something like that. It will allow interesting new designs, that's what I'm saying. Or we could go for planes, not going for planes, not going to do that. Or we could go for the small, small probes. Or we could go for the radiators. Or hell, we could go for the docking ports and the and the radiators. That's, ah, that's what I'm going to do. Docking ports and radiators. Isn't that wonderful? Docking ports here. And what does that unlock for us? That unlocks advanced metalworks, larger heat shields, that's good. Larger girders, that's good. Larger, eh, what, did we not get, just get the docking port? Oh, we just got the big docking port, not the small one. So this gives us the small docking port. Some more separators and stuff. This is painful. This is an expensive node and it doesn't really do anything for us, except gives us more stuff, which is good, I suppose. And probies, no, radiators, a small radial radiator, a radial radiator, that's nice. We're going to do that, and that will allow us to make uh, larger ships. Larger ships are always good, and we can cool them. Am I sure about this? Am I sure about this? Do I not rather want... Oh, I can't get this. Do I not rather want tiny probes? Oh, I'm sleepy. No, I'm going to get the radiators and the expandable solar panels and doing a few more moon missions and of course to get the science from high above the moon that's a very easy mission yeah I'm going to do that getting this boom more unlocks and what does this enable us to get the communitron seismic sensor dual technique magnetometer a device used to measure the magnetic field of the planet is placed in orbit of. It's also capable of detecting the abundance of useful antimatter particle in the magnetosphere. This is a KSP interstellar bit, and that will give us science and will let us get antimatter and a gamma ray spectrometer. I'm assuming this will make us get more science, so that's high on the priorities list now. This is this is nice. This is good stuff. And here we get heat radiators. I think what we got here was also radiators. Small radiators. So these are probably larger. Electric generators. That is also important because we can attach that to a nuclear generator, uh, to a nuclear reactor and generate electricity with that. So this basically allows us to build better stuff again. Right, many choices coming up. The only probable the, the only proper answer to this is to get all the science in the world and unlock all of it so for now this was lorenzo thanks for watching see you next time with a whole new 
bunch of stuff to build stuff with so click like if you did or are looking forward to that and of course i want you to hit subscribe if you did so already thank you for doing so it's always nice to see those subscriber numbers go high as the sky as my rockets do i'm out of corny things to say and going to sleep so good night to you or good morning if that's the appropriate time of day this was lorenzo goodbye